I'm just going to go ahead and uh, watch some Chomsky, give some of my critique, and uh, hopefully get some people rolling in here and have some nice discussions or terrible ones. Why you cannot have a capitalist democracy? Interesting. No, 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 no. I started by saying that one of the relations between capitalism and democracy is contradiction. You can't have capitalist democracy. And the people who really sort of believe in markets, or at least pretend to understand that, so if you read Milton Friedman and other apostles of so-called libertarianism, they don't call for democracy. They call for what they call freedom, which is a very, a very restrictive concept of freedom. It's not the freedom of a, a, a working person to control their work, their lives, and so on. It's their freedom to submit themselves to control by a higher authority. That's called freedom. Uh, but not democracy. They don't like democracy, and they're right. Uh, capitalism and democracy really are inconsistent. Uh, actually, what's called libertarianism in the United States is about as extremely extreme an example of anti-libertarianism that you can imagine. They're in favor of private tyranny, the worst kind of tyranny. tyranny Private tyranny. Tyranny by unaccountable private concentrations of wealth in the United States is about as extremely extreme an example. I'm going to rewind and play this probably a bunch of times, so no, no, I'm not. bear with me. I started by saying that one of the relations between capitalism and democracy is contradiction. You can't have capitalist democracy. You can't have capitalist democracy. Why? In theory, or is he just talking about like in practice today? So is he saying in theory, you can't have these two things? Capitalism, an economic system characterized by private or corporate ownership of capital goods by investments that are determined by private decision and by prices, production, and the distribution of goods that are determined mainly by competition in a free market. Other definitions uh, block this here. Capitalism also called free market economy or free enterprise economy, is it, aren't they? An economic system dominant in the Western world since breakup of feudalism, in which most means of productions are privately owned and production is guided and income distributed, distributed largely through operation of markets. So Britannica says, is capitalism also called free market economy or free enterprise economy? Economic system dominant in the Western world since breakup of feudalism, which most means of production is privately owned and production is guided and income distributed largely through the operation of markets. What do you mean by markets? A middleman between a sale? Something like that? Okay, sure. Private or corporate ownership of capital goods. So he's saying they can't exist to get like <laughs> right off the bat. It's very strong, like absolute statements that I, I, there's so much baggage. I started this. by saying that one of the relations between capitalism and democracy is contradiction. You can't have capitalist democracy. And the people who really. So you can't have private ownership of goods, which are sold in competition of a free market. I don't understand how you could how you could say that. I'm trying to figure out like why would you think that capitalism and democracy can't exist together? Or wait, what's his exact word? Democracy is contradiction. You can't have capitalist democracy. You can't have capitalist democracy. Is that an adjective or is it two things together? Let's assume both and either or. So capitalist democracy. See, I, f I feel like he's saying you can't have maybe fairness or something that benefits the people. Rather, it benefits privatization or the owners of the capital goods. I feel like that's his that's what he's loading into his baggage or that's what you would kind of have to maybe one of the choices you'd have to load into that statement. And the people who really sort of believe in markets or at least pretend to understand that so if you read milton friedman and 
other apostles of so-called libertarianism, that they don't call for democracy. They call for what they call freedom, which is a very, in, a very restrictive concept of freedom. It's not the freedom of a, a, a working person to control their work, their lives, and so on. It's a working person to control their free work, their lives, and so on. Their work, their lives. And I was kind of blending or blurring that original statement that capitalist democracies is, is, can't exist. It's their or is, I forget his exact words. Freedom to submit themselves to control by a higher authority. That's called. Oops. Control by a higher authority. That's called freedom, uh, but not democracy. They don't like democracy, and they're right. Uh, capitalism and democracy really are inconsistent. Uh, actually, it's called freedom, uh, but not democracy. They don't like democracy, and they're right. Uh, capitalism and democracy really are inconsistent. Why would you say that Milton Freeman doesn't like democracy? See, this is when you have to sit somebody down and say, what, what does democracy mean? Because the way you're using it right now, by definition, kind of makes sense but kind of doesn't in that you have to have a definition that is outside of the formal one. Something that you've already established, which is very similar to the definition, but not exactly. And all these little ideas that you're blending in and then, and then you forget that you've done that or that you, you don't even know that you do that. And you just, you get these loaded terms and a loaded form of democracy as a definition. Uh Actually, what's called libertarianism in the United States is about as extremely extreme an example of anti-libertarianism that you can imagine. They're in favor of private tyranny, the worst kind of tyranny. I'm assuming saying private tyranny is in capitalism <laughs> or anything that's not socialism or that submits to whatever the will of the general populace is tyranny by unaccountable private concentrations of wealth yeah tyranny by unaccountable private concentrations of wealth i don't see i don't think about as extremely uh, i don't think liber i don't think anyone wants unless you're a schemer or extreme an example of anti hold on uh, let me listen to this again before i say that extremely extreme an example of anti-libertarianism that you can imagine. They're in favor of private tyranny, the worst kind of tyranny. Tyranny by unaccountable private concentrations of wealth. Una they're in favor of unaccountable private concentrations of wealth. Even if we take that as a business person, let's say you own a gas company. I don't think you, like as a as a principal in your life or how you do business with other people, I don't think you'd want them to be unaccounted for because that would mean they would be taking advantage or they would be able to take advantage of you as a potential business partner or customer. So even if, I think even if you owned a major business like where you owned a private resource or a good or something like some kind of an extreme example that's probably what you know something that he's thinking of he's probably not thinking of like a small business i don't think that person would want unaccountability and tyranny like sure maybe they would want to get the most out of what their business can legally obtain but they wouldn't want others to be unaccounted for and just a tyrannical form of business you know like it's 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 a huge stretch and just like, who do you know who wants unaccountability in the entire market and the entire system of capitalism? You know, who's who's that level of crazy, of absolute, it's not even like logically sound. It's like selfishly, if you think about it, it's just, it's selfishly self-sabotage, you know? Even though you may be able to ty tyrannically rule your business and gather money and power and whatever the other business in your competition or just adjacent to you in some way or that you're a customer for will do the same to you and <laughs> it would be pure chaos it's it's like saying that people want 
pure chaos in capitalism. It's just so assumptive and yeah, I don't know, man. It's just a weird thing to say. But the worst kind of tyranny, tyranny by unaccountable private concentrations of wealth. But may I don't know, maybe he feels that way because he he sees things that companies are doing, doesn't agree with it because it's selfish and therefore it aligns in some way with what he's saying, like a, a privatization of this tyrannical form of business. And maybe he sees people who support those businesses or ideas that he interprets as that. Maybe, I don't know, maybe he sees that as the same or just in support of it. When they say, uh, well, we don't want government interference in the market, uh, they mean that. They mean, uh, maybe they don't understand it, but if you think it through, it's pretty obvious. The kind of interference think it through it's pretty odd i don't want government interference in the market they don't want government interference in the market okay who and why i can think of cases where you actually don't want government interference in markets for example say you're say you're a phone company okay and things like this have happened in history this is just in support of a potential positive case for not wanting government in business say you're a phone company and uh, we're, we're at a point in history where we're just starting to set up, um, like major infrastructure for communications and phones and whatever. And the government wants to invest in this type of infrastructure. So they, you know, they, uh, they build a series of contracts for private businesses, capitalism in the capitalism society to bid on. And the winner, through whatever means, whether that's price, whether it's quality, whether it's a combination of that and other things, let's say that company wins. Maybe they deserved it, maybe they didn't. But now you have a case where the government is funding uh, a potentially massive endeavor by this business, which will grow them to God knows how big. And I'm sure this has happened in history. And I'm sure you could look this, I'm sure you could Google this. And, um, you know, potentially um, picking like a crappy company, um, potentially taking up contracts that another private business would have had, or it, they would have had that territory. But let's say the government took over that territory and just kind of consolidated it towards the business that they invested in toward, for that bid contract. So it, in other words, it could be indirectly screwing up the market or affecting a market with a sort of synthetic choosing of a business rather than the market choosing, you know, this is the best company for this customer and therefore it organically grows. So it's a, it's almost like you have a potential organically grown business, which grows into something huge. And hopefully through that, they develop their own infrastructure of you know, properly satisfying and servicing the customer. Um, in the other case, you have the government, which could just synthetically build up that company, you know, bypass um, the customer uh, business interaction, you know, building along the way. This, this kind of feedback that, you know, keeps both people in check in some way. Obviously, it can go shit at times. But you have... I mean, you could probably see how there's those two different situations can produce an outcome which is not favorable to either the customers or the marketplace for those other businesses, which were, you know, in those kind of phone company businesses. So that's a case where you could potentially, um, I mean, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't screw up the market, but you would you'd be affecting it in a way which may not produce the best result. And there's so many different variables that you could think of, of how people and businesses would be affected, both in positive and negative ways, that you can make a case for what he's talking about, libertarians or whatever, saying that they don't want any government intervention or regulation. You could see, you could see the case where that's definitely something that you would you may want tyranny tyranny by unaccountable private concentrations of wealth when they say uh, well we don't want government interference in the market uh, they mean that 
They mean, maybe they don't understand it, but if you think it through, it's pretty obvious. The kind of interference in the market they want to block is the kind that would permit unconstrained tyranny on the part of totally unaccountable uh, private tyrannies, which is what corporations are. So such and also such massive blanket statements and just generalizations like you just can't if you're I don't know exactly what Noam Chomsky is but if you're someone who comments on these kind of policy government sociology kind of things you can't make statements like that it's like you you can't it's it's just it's a it's the thing is, like, he almost says it in a way where you almost forgive him because of, like, the tone he speaks. Because um, normally, if, if you were to say these things that he's saying in a different, how would you say, like, inflection, um, tone, volume of voice, mannerisms, you'd be, people would, I don't think people would listen to him, you know? Or... People wouldn't take it as seriously, or they, it might register in your head as, oh, this is kind of, this is kind of dangerous thoughts. Worth bearing in mind how radically opposed this is to classical liberalism. Now, they like to invoke, say, Adam Smith, but if you read Adam Smith, he said the opposite. He, he's famous for not, you know, the, the claim is that he was opposed to regulation, government regulation. Uh, interference in markets. It's not true. He was in favor of regulation, as he put it, when it benefits the working man. Sorry, I wasn't he listening to that. The opposite. Now, they like to invoke, say, Adam Smith. But if you read Adam Smith, he said the opposite. He, he's famous for not, you know, the, the claim is that he was opposed to regulation, government regulation, uh, interference in markets. It's not true. He was in favor of regulation, as he put it, when it benefits the working man. He was against interference when it benefited the masters. That's traditional classical. He was against interference with the masters. That's tradition. He was against interference when it benefited the masters. He was against interference when it benefited when it benefited the masters. The, the, claim is that he was opposed to regulation, government regulation, uh, interference in markets. It's not true. He was in favor of regulation, as he put it, when it benefits the working man. He was against interference when it benefited the masters. That's traditional classical liberalism. He's saying Adam Smith wanted regulation. Of regulation, as he put it, when it benefits the working man. He wanted a regulation to benefit the working man? He was against interference when it benefited the masters. And against regulation when it benefits the masters. Why use masters? Why use that? <laughs> Come on. Come on. That's traditional classical liberalism. This, what's called libertarian in the United States, which likes to invoke the, the history that they've... I still think that would generally be... I would think if you actually sat people down, that would be something that they would be in favor for. In other words, regulation which doesn't allow you to take advantage of people. Uncocted is uh, radically opposed to basic class libertarian principles. And uh, it's kind of astonishing to me that a lot of young people, say college students, are attracted by this kind of thing. I mean, you can, after all, read the classical texts. And so take, say, Adam Smith. I mean, Adam Smith at the time, uh, he's the icon, you know, of liberty. Uh, he's, uh, he was considered to be a dangerous radical at the time because he was pretty anti-capitalist. It's pre, sort of pre-capitalist era, but he was opposed to it. Uh, he condemned what he called the, the vile maxim of the masters of mankind, all for ourselves and nothing for anyone else. Uh, that's an abomination. Uh, the, take the phrase invisible hand. Everybody's learned that in high school or college. Uh, Adam Smith actually did use the term, rarely. But take a look at how he used it in Wealth of Nations, his major work. It's used once. 
And if you look at the context, it's an argument again against what is now called neoliberal globalization. And what he argued is this, he was concerned with England, of course. He said, suppose in England that the merchants and manufacturers invested abroad and imported from abroad. He said, well, that would be profitable for them, but would be harmful to the people of England. However, they will have enough of a commitment to their own country, to England, what's called a home bias in the literature. They'll have enough of a home bias so that as if by an invisible hand, they'll keep to the less profitable actions and England will be saved from the ravages of what we call neoliberal globalization. That's the one use of the term in Wealth of Nations. In his other major work, Moral Sentiments, terms also used once, and the context is this. It's, remember, England's basically an agricultural <coughs> country then. He says, suppose some landlord uh, uh, accumulates an enormous amount of land and everybody else has to work for him. He says, well, that won't turn out too badly. And the reason is that the landlord will be motivated by his natural sympathy for other people. So he will make sure that the necessities of life and the goods available will be distributed uh, equitably to the to his, uh, the people on his lands, and it'll end up uh, with this, uh, an equal, relatively equal and just uh, distribution of wealth, as if by an invisible hand. Now, that's his other use of the term. Uh, just compare that with what you're taught in school or what you read in the newspapers. And it goes across the board, like everybody probably has read uh, the first paragraphs of Wealth of Nations, which talks about how wonderful it is that the butcher pursues his interests and the baker pursues in his interests, we're all happy. So we should be in favor of a division of labor. Everybody's read that. Uh, how many people have read a couple of hundred pages into Wealth of Nations where he has a bitter attack on division of labor for interesting reasons, and reasons that were standard in the Enlightenment environment in which he lived, very different from ours. Uh, he says, if you, if you pursue division of labor, people will be directed to actions in which they'll just repeat the same mechanical operations over and over. They'll be de-skilled. Okay, that's the goal of management for 100 years, de-skill the workforce. He says, that's what will happen if you pursue division of labor. He goes on to say, this will turn people into creatures as stupid and ignorant as a human being can possibly be. This is this is a very Marxist take. I mean, this is straight this is straight out of Marxism and its critique of division of labor. Exact exact same words from Marxism, basically exact same concept. And therefore, in any civilized society, the government will have to intervene to prevent any development like this. So. Is he saying that Adam Smith said this about division of labor? That's Adam Smith's view of division of labor. The next step. Is it? Let's look into that. Division of labor is one of the most important concepts in social science. Not let me, let me. Okay, let me find. No, no, no. I don't want. I don't want this. I want his quotes. I want Adam Smith quotes. I don't want interpretations. Okay, let's read all the quotes. Political economy, considered as a branch of the science, the statement or legislator proposes two distinct objects. First, to provide a plentiful revenue or substance for the people, or more properly, to enable them to provide such a revenue or substance for themselves. And secondly, to supply the state or commonwealth with the revenue sufficient for the public services. Proposes to enrich both the people and the sovereign. This is, I've seen this before, talked about by the founding fathers. So, for just as all other arts are developed to superior excellence in large cities, in that same way the food at the, wait, 
I'm just thinking as a kind of precursor to all this. The assumption is that division of labor will produce a person who is naive of how to produce basic things or necessities to at whatever level to sustain you. Let's say basic level, let's say like thriving, like I have a nice house and whatnot. You'll be naive to yourself be independent to gather or make those kind of resources. That's the assumption that division, division of labor will be. You'll just produce this automaton who, let's say, just builds a, a fucking part within a phone and that's all they know and they go home and they just don't know anything. Um, but this assumes that the person's life revolves completely around the division of labor they choose to work in. And that first, they have no other interests. And second, they have never, they're never exposed to a situation where they have to have some kind of independence or create something of such a basic survival level. Um, and if you think about the, a time, the time in history when even Adam Smith is talking about this or Marx, it's a completely different time where now we have... I mean, even with like disasters and COVID and whatnot, we have things to fall back on where we still don't need to <laughs> chop down trees to make our own fire, to heat our houses and, or, you know, hunt wild game. It's like it takes, it's like saying, it's like, although yes, it's very useful both psychologically and physically for you to be able to produce something you need in life and look back and say, I built this, this entire thing. Like I built this table so that we can eat on. Like it's an important psychological thing to do something like that in your life. And it doesn't even have to be physical. It can be a piece of music. It can be something in your head. It can be an idea. Um, but anyway, that's that's an important aspect of like anyone's life. It, it, it it's, it's not a necessity, but it, it brings a level of satisfaction. Kind of forgot my train of thought. All right, let's go back to this. <laughs> Come back to that. Okay. For just as all, all others, arts are developed to superior excellent in large cities. In that same way, the food at the king's palace is also elaborately prepared with superior excellence. For in small towns, the same works workman makes chairs and doors and plows and tables, and often... The same artisan builds houses, and even so, he's thankful if he can only find employment enough to support him. And it is, of course, impossible for a man of many trades to be proficient in all of them. In large cities, on the other hand, inasmuch, it's a weird word, as many people have demands to make upon each branch of industry, one trade alone, and very often even less than a whole trade, is enough to support a man. One man, for instance, makes shoes for men and another for women, and there are places even where one man earns a living by only stitching shoes, another by cutting them out, another by sewing the uppers together, while there is another who performs none of these operations, but only assembles the parts. It follows, therefore, as a matter of course, that he who devotes himself to a very highly specialized line of work is bound to do it in the best possible manner. So this is in favor for division of labor, specialization, because you become a master of that specific task service that you're doing over and over and over again. It's just like practicing an instrument or something, playing a game over and over, the same level over and over again. So I think in this interpretation here, the guy is saying um, quality, the amount that you produce, it's much higher under division, division of labor or specialization. This is the very definition of wealth, of course. It's, it's, this is not the very definition of wealth. It, it's a means to wealth, potentially greater wealth. The second is that the system was irreversible. If the society had tried to return to a system of autarky, <laughs> with each household supplying its own needs, the results would not have been impoverment, impoverishment, but starvation. Division of labor and specialization, which sort of philosophically is talking about here, is a bad thing if that 
is your entire existence. If the time you wake to the time you go to bed is all you do, and all you do is that specialization, let's say, you just, you just sew shoes all day. And that's all you do. And then when you go home, you eat. And then you go to bed. You don't think about anything else. You don't have any goals in life. That person, and I don't think that's reasonable. Like, I think people, they might not have huge achievements or goals, but they just don't, I don't think they solely stick to that, like, as the majority. I mean, some, obviously some do. If you're at, you know, maybe you have to work like three jobs or one job for the whole day. But for that person who that's all they do all day, I mean, it could be, it could be a bad thing and it could be a good thing. It could be bad, like, it, let's say if you just get replaced by a machine, then this work that you've been doing for insert the amount of time, days, years, decades, you're now completely obsolete and you have no other skills to, I would say, rebound to. Um, but still, you're you're viewing that person as almost a, a uh, you know, when you're building a character in a video game, it's like you're viewing them as that, as like a machine. You're viewing them as like they're helpless. They don't know how to like want other things and do other things, which I think is very disingenuous to the conversation. Like, obviously, if you have a person who just sews shoes all day and he gets replaced by a machine, obviously there's going to be a period in his life where it's going to be tough because he doesn't have, he may not have skills which transfer to other forms of work that he now has to look for. But he has to ha spend time to go to another line of work. So it's, it's obviously going to be tough for that person. But it's such a, it's a terrible look on just humanity and people to say that, oh, they're just, they're, they're going to, they'll, <laughs> well, starvation, the results will be impoverishment, impoverishment or starvation. They'll just die. They'll wither and die because there are these, these helpless people who are unable to learn new skills because all they have known is how to sew shoes. I, I think that's just not a, that's just not a thing. It's just not, people are resilient though. They may get beat down, you know, metaphorically through losing that division of labor job, whatever it is, but... I don't think history has shown that people just succumb to the loss of specialization in their division of labor and just give up. Some do. Some actually kill themselves or it leads to people killing themselves. But it's, it's not the majority of like what what happens. We have uh, we have centuries to back up that concept, too. You know, and if if this was true, if division of labor and specialization and the critique, the Marxist kind of critique that it produces helpless, naive, ignorant people who are unable to sustain themselves. Um, we would see, we would see people just dropping like flies and solely due to that, that reason, solely due to either they're maintaining that division of labor spot their entire life or maintaining that and then having that removed and then just withering away there's just not there's not a good case for that critique of how it affects people it's just a potential outcome you could potentially produce someone who's ignorant and naive of everything and is that even that bad i don't it's there's there's so much to read into with that okay let's see what else <clears throat> The classics had to say about it. Smith's contribution. What then was his contribution? Tell me. Tell me, sir. This great increase of the quality of work, which in consequence of the division of labor, the same amount of people are capable of performing. Owing to three different circumstances. First, to the increase of dexterity in every particular work workman. Secondly, to the saving of the time, which is commonly lost in passing from one species of work to another. Lastly, to the invention of a great number of machines which facilitate and abridge labor and enable one man to do the work of many. The division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. And labor is limited by the extent of the market. I want to read more. I need more. More quotes. Workers perform tasks as efficiently as possible. Not only does the organization benefit from lower costs and greater output per worker, but workers should be less fatigued. This point of view 
has for years formed the basis of classical industrial engineering, which looks for the simplest way to structure work to maximize efficiency. Typically applying industrial engineering to a job reduces the complexity of work, making it so simple that almost anyone can be trained quickly and easily to perform the job. Such jobs tend to be highly specialized and repetitive. Is too much. Division of labor is good, but it's too much a good thing. So it could be bad in that simple and repetitive tasks become boring. And let's say you're an iPhone worker and you hate your life because that's all you do. But that's, well, that's, that's true. But that's, that's a case when that's all you do your entire day. I think they have crazy hours that they work. So a case for, a case for this is too much of a good thing. What was the iPhone suicide thing? Uh, that was in China, right? China, right. But wh what were the working conditions? This is a perfect example, a perfect extreme example. I don't, I don't even know if this is capitalism. This is almost capitalist communism. Okay, here, here we go. Let's get some insight into this. It's not a good place for human beings. Conditions are bad. Very high pressure. Regular 12 hour shifts. Bosses being jerks. Saying you'd get pay, but you don't. Are they fucking sleeping in there, bro? See, this isn't. <laughs> this is. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's, let's keep finding out more. Really boring. Real meticulous work. Fastening chipboards and assembling back covers. A minute a piece for each that's up to 700 phones. If you don't do it, you get shat on. You can't use the restroom. Like this is, there are so many elements that if someone were to bring this situation and say, oh, here's what division of labor produces. Here's what capitalism produces. No, this is what just an extreme, inhumane lack of regard for workers produces <laughs> passive aggressive <laughs> when the boss comes down to expect the work inspect the work if they find any problems they won't scold you then they will scold you in front of everyone at a meeting later so it's almost like oh it's such communism it's such group it's not i want to i want to take you aside and help you it's i want you to fall in line with the people and i'm going to use your peers as a mean to discipline you psychologically make you fall in line it's that's such a classic tactic yes it's insulting and humiliating yeah systematic you have to <laughs> oh no man. that's terrible mm -hmm, mm -hmm. high stress work anxiety humiliation contributes to widespread depression yeah that's that's terrible that could wear you down man is this like a lunch table it's not a sweatshop <laughs> i mean it's kind of borderline sweatshop we look at everything at these companies boxcom is not a sweatshop it's a factory but my gosh they have restaurants and movies come on come on they've had suicides and suicides attempts and they have four hundred thousand people there rate is under what the u.s rate is but it's still that's a stupid thing to say as a company dumb what a dumb thing to say what a political thing to say right <laughs> totally uh whatever it's not a smart thing to say 150 gathered on a roof rooftop and threatened to jump oh god man that's crazy they eventually <laughs> they eventually met the demands of the rooftop Threateners. <laughs> China's terrible. Oh my god. It's pretty uh pretty dirty looking place there. So this is a case where this I wouldn't even consider this an extreme case of division of labor because there's so many outside influences within that division of labor, like just terrible work conditions that it's it's not even uh, they're separate things but they're they're intertwined and if you were making an argument against division of labor and you use this case it would be very disingenuous to the topic it's like you'd have to look at division of labor within like a reasonable like okay here's a reasonable amount of work per week you know like a normal 40 hour work week you don't want to look at 12 hours a day for the whole week one single specialized job you eat sleep there get chastised and 
humiliated by bosses, humiliated if you try to ask for a bathroom break. Like that's that's not within division of labor. That's a that's a that's a consequential side effect of something like evil that hasn't been restrained. You know, like the motivation for those people to humiliate the worker is to maintain their job. And at the top of the chain, I'm sure it's probably something along the lines of create as close as you can a robot which pumps it out at these quotas. Do whatever you can to keep them in line and, and for the sake of money and maintaining prosperity within the company. It's like obviously that's a motivational factor, but it's not inherent to capitalism. It's just an exploitation of selfishness and greed. It's like capitalism isn't inherently greed, although it can be, which I think is a very important distinct distinction to make. All right, what else does Adam Smith say here? The man whose whole life is spent performing a few simple operations, which the effects are perhaps always the same or very nearly the same, has no occasion to exert his understanding or to exercise his invention in finding out the expedients for removing difficulties which never occur. He naturally loses, therefore, the habit of such exertion and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. Oof. The torpor, what does that word mean? State of mental or physical inactivity or insensibility. Lethargy. Of his mind renders him not only incapable of relishing or bearing a part of any rational conversation, but of conceiving any generous, generous, noble, or tender sentiment. Makes me want chicken tenders. Side note. And consequently, of forming any just judgment concerning many even of the ordinary duties of a private life. Okay, I can see that. I can see where if you had to produce your own good, say I had to produce my own table, there are many challenges in producing that table and the different divisions of that labor or good, right? So rather than being a worker who solely produces a nail which goes in the table. When you are that person who produces the entirety of the table, you cut the wood, you create the nail, you do everything. You, there's challenges which you face in each step along the way, which develop a set of problem solving s skills and just like, let's say, psychological fulfillment of, I had a problem, I had to, Stop, critically think, trial and error, do this and that. I got through it. I struggled through it. I have something to produce for it. I remember that. It's something real to me now. And it's something that I can carry on specifically if I produce this thing again or something similar again, maybe transfer that to a different subject. And that's that's a fulfilling aspect. And it um, it just it transfers to different things in your life. I can totally see that. But again, this is under the context that this is all you do and that you have no ambition to do anything else in life where you are faced with that kind of problem solving, trial and error fulfillment and psychological fulfillment. And even so, even so, take the case of those Apple workers. Are they this person? You know, if they're working 12 hours a day, are they stupid and ignorant? They have no capability to take part in a conversation of something noble, tender, judgment. Maybe, but probably not. Because this kind of just inherently assumes that this is their entire life. is producing that one thing and then just there. There's no humanity ascribed to that hypothetical person in that extreme division of labor. And that's the issue with saying those kinds of things. You assume too much. You assume the extreme and apply that as a generalization. And obviously, if people are depressed working through monotonous work, there's a desire to um, fulfill this kind of problem solving, produce something by yourself as a whole. There, there, there's a desire for that fulfillment. And um, you can't just assume that it's 
that that person's life will be constrained to solely their work. Maybe in a in a this oppressive workplace, like something that came out of China, sure, or maybe something in our past, sure. But that's that's a separate thing that you you need to fix. You know, like that shouldn't they they shouldn't exist together. It shouldn't be viewed as a as inseparable. Specialization, division of labor, can be separated from that psychological unfulfillment. Okay, anything else he says here? No? Okay. Let's see what this website says. Okay, there seems to be something else. Uh, the difference of natural talents in men is in reality much less than we are aware of. And the very different genius which appears to distinguish men of different professions when grown up to maturity is not upon many occasions so much the cause as the effect of division of labor. Not sure how to interpret that. The difference between the most dissimilar characters, between a philosopher and a common street porter, for example, seems to arise not so much from nature as from habit, custom, and education. So he's making the case for uh, nature versus nurture, uh, and that your environment shapes you rather than, yeah, let's just say that, I think. When they came into the world... And for the first six or eight years of their existence, they were perhaps very much alike and neither their parents nor playfellows could perceive any remarkable difference. Sure, sure. About that age or soon after, they come to be employed in very different op occupations. Wow, did they work that young? Six to eight? <laughs> the difference of talents comes then to be taken notice of and widens by degrees, till at last the vanity of the philosopher is willing to acknowledge the difference of talents comes to then be taken notice of, and widens by degrees, till at last the vanity of the philosopher is willing to acknowledge scarce, willing to acknowledge, there's supposed to be a comma there, I'll just scarce any resemblance, acknowledge accept any resemblance does anybody else do this they have to read things like fucking eight times i think i think he's saying when you're young we're all kind of very similar and then once our environment pushes us into different ways of life and jobs and people and environment we start to separate or let's say um our environment shapes us and it nurtures certain aspects or you're, you're, you're a consequence of like being around these people and doing these things, whatever that consequence may, may be. Right. So, so different things widen for the better. Some things never get nurtured or expanded and you just, they become stagnant. Whereas another person that might've grown because of their environment and things they've done in that environment. The difference of talents comes then to be taken notice of and widens by degrees till at last the vanity of the philosopher is willing to acknowledge scarce any resemblance. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Is he saying that the philosopher becomes conscious of this? The difference of natural talents in different men is in reality much less than we are aware of. And the very different genius which appears to distinguish men Different professions, when grown up to maturity, is not upon many occasions so much the cause as the effect division of labor. So he's saying basically, I think he's saying what what I've thought before that excellence is not a, pro, a excellence generally is not a product of something you're born into or something you're genetically prescribed to. It's it's an effect of the environment. What is a common street porter? Porter and the philosopher. Is, can I get a fucking interpretation, man? Uh, hey, I could go for a nice porter. What is a street porter, dude? What is porter? A person stationed at a door or gate to admit or assist those entering. Porter, street porter. So somebody who's at a, a like a dock, a port. A person who carries burdens. One employed to carry baggage for patrons at a hotel or transportation terminal. So, so like a, like a, like a, like a bellboy. Parlor, car, or sleeping car attendant. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what is this, dude? A parlor, car, or sleeping car attendant who waits on a passenger's 
waits on passengers and makes up births. Bro, I got to Google every single thing. Everything that was said in here. What the hell is a parlor car? Sleeping car attendant. So like a train, something a train. Okay, a train. So maybe like a ferry. <laughs> oh man, a person who does routine cleaning. Okay, so it seems to just be like a, a common, simple worker. Just okay. Let's let's say that's what he's talking about. A philosopher is so somebody who's who's wise and reflective versus someone who just works all day. The difference between the most dissimilar characters between a philosopher and a common street porter. Okay, first of all, how do you know that street porter isn't <laughs> a philosopher as well? Come on now. It's very, very yeah. Okay, for example, seems to not, sorry, seems to arise not so much from nature as from habit, custom, and education. When they came to the world, blah, 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 blah. Till at last the vanity of the philosopher is willing to acknowledge scarce any resemblance. <sighs> okay, that's kind of what they're saying. They're kind of saying what I was saying here. Mm -hmm. When the market is very small, no person can have any encouragement to dedicate himself entirely to one employment for want of the power to exchange all that surplus part of the produce, his own labor, which is over and above his own consumption for such parts of the produce of other men's labor as he has occasion for. I think Adam Smith kind of is saying, making kind of an absolute, like uh, an absolute statement of a consequence, like, it's something that could be true, but maybe not. Here's a research society. The government will have to intervene to prevent any development like this. And that's Adam Smith's view of division of labor. The next step, um, here's a research project. Take the standard edition, scholarly edition of Wealth of Nations, uh, produced by the University of Chicago Press, naturally, on the bicentennial with a scholarly apparatus, you know, footnotes and everything else. And take a look at the index. There's a scholarly index. Look up division of labor. This part of the book is not referenced. You can't find it unless you decide to read 700 pages. Then you can find it. But that's his concept of division of labor. And it continues like this. I mean, I'm not extolling you know, a lot of things that are you can harshly criticize, like his advice to the colonies. But nevertheless, it's a very different picture from what's called the libertarianism or capitalism today. A capitalist democracy would self-destruct. Capitalism would self-destruct. So uh, I, I, is he saying, I think what Chomsky is saying, that Adam Smith was critiquing division of labor in that um, it will produce let's say what stupid people in some way even if he felt that way i still feel like you can um be for division of labor and it can still coincide positively within democracy and that in that capitalism and democracy can positively work together that's why it hasn't been instituted uh, the, the masters understand that they cannot survive a capitalist economy let's say fair economy you take a look at the history, it's pretty interesting. Uh, so the United States, when it was, it was independent, so it could reject the rules of sound economics and it developed. And there were other countries that were poised for industrial revolution and were given the same advice, like Egypt and India. In fact, India already was the commercial industrial center of the world, more so than England. Egypt was poised for an industrial revolution. And it's not impossible that it might have developed. It was a rich agrarian society. It had cotton, produced cotton. As I say, that's the main product, like oil today. And it didn't need slaves. It had peasants. Uh, it had a developmental government uh, aimed at uh, industrial development. It could have taken off, just as India could have taken off. But they were not free to reject sound economics because they were ruled by British force. So they were forced to accept sound economics. 
and Egypt became Egypt, and the United States became the United States. Uh, India went through a century of de-development until it finally got independent. Uh, that's what happens when you apply laissez-faire principles. In fact, that's essentially how the third world and the first world divided. You take a look at the countries that developed. They're the countries who violated the principles. Uh, England, the United States, uh, Germany, France, uh, um, the low, uh, Netherlands. Uh, violated what One principles? country of the South, one country developed, Japan, the one country that wasn't colonized and was able to pursue the same course that the rich countries developed. Uh, I, I mentioned that in mid-19th century, 1846, Britain was so far ahead of the rest of the world in industrial development that they did decide that laissez-faire would be possible. So they moved to what's called a free trade uh, era. It didn't, first of all, they imposed sharp constraints on it. Uh, they cut off the empire, India. India was not allowed to, others could not invest in India, their main possession and India was not allowed to develop. Uh, and there were other restrictions, but pretty soon, uh, British capitalists called the game off uh, because they couldn't compete. And by the 1920s, they couldn't compete with the Japanese production. So they literally closed off the empire uh, to Japanese exports. That's part of the background for the Pacific War in the 1940s. The United States did the same with its smaller empire, the Philippines. The Dutch did the same with Indonesia. Uh, all the imperial systems decided no more free trade, we can't compete. Uh, so they closed off the empire, meaning Japan had no markets, no resources, and they went to war. Uh, that's a large part of the background. The United States in 1945 did uh, uh, move towards laissez-faire. In fact, there was an important conference. The United States was basically running the world at that point, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, there was a hemispheric conference called by Washington, February 1945 in Mexico, uh, where the Western Hemisphere was compelled to adopt an economic charter for the Americas, uh, which, which banned any interference with market principles. The goal was, you read the State Department reports, to oppose the new nationalism in Latin America, which is based on the idea that the resource, that the people of a country should benefit from the country's resources. That's evil, can't allow that. It's Western and U.S. investors who have to benefit from their resources. So that was the economic charter of the Americas imposed on the countries of the hemisphere, with one exception here. Now, the United States did not follow those policies. Quite the contrary, as I mentioned, there was a massive development of a state. Uh, is that even, uh, how do you even verify that? That, that the people of a country should benefit from the country's resources. That's evil, can't allow that. It's Western and U.S. investors who have to benefit from their resources. So that was the economic charter of the Americas imposed on the countries of the hemisphere, with one exception. He's expert. Uh, okay, first of all, he's going into so many, so many side notes of, like, things that aren't inherent to capitalism and democracy. Just like, it, like, and it's saying it in a way where, like, it's like, okay, Capitalism democracy is in, in what is tried to be that is inherently ex exploitative. It's it's when it's not. It's just like that's things that have produced when people are unchecked with moral with morality. It didn't. First of all, they imposed sharp constraints on it. Uh, they. Uh, or I don't know if that would be morality, right? Like, because let's say in a case where you have a country who's producing a good for another country, you would want the producer of that good to benefit the most from that or more so than the country that you're producing it for. It, it should be beneficial. It should be mutually beneficial. 
but it should be more beneficial for the country, both in terms of like the company producing it and the people within that country. You would think, right? You would think that's what you'd want. Cut off the empire, India. India was not allowed to, others could not. But this is, that's a whole argument for, for and against globalization, right? So let's just say you have a resource. Let's say you have, let's just make up some random numbers. Let's say you have 10 tons of coal for your country. And let's say you sell f half of your coal to another country. And would it be more beneficial for your country to do that and consolidate a majority of that transaction within that company, which is then spread through the workers? Or it'd be more beneficial for you to not have that and for the country to make that transaction within its own nation so that the entire wealth is circulated within the country. So the resources that you would obviously need, you would obviously need coal at some point, would be circulated in your country. The money would be circulated in your country and it would affect financially your entire country as a whole more. Would that be more beneficial rather than opening up a market to globalization and free trade within different nations? That's a whole that's a whole other topic, which I think he's touching on kind of indirectly and in trying, uh, I don't know. One country of the South, again. one country developed, Japan, the one country that wasn't colonized and was able to pursue the same course that the rich countries developed. Uh, I, I mentioned that in, in mid-19th century, 1846, Britain was so far ahead of the rest of the world in industrial development that they did ex decide that laissez-faire would be possible. So they moved to what's called the free trade uh, era. It didn't, first of all, they imposed sharp constraints on it. Uh, they uh, cut off the empire, India. India was not allowed to, others could not invest in India, their main possession. And India was not allowed to develop. Uh, and there were other restrictions. But pretty soon, uh, British capitalists called the game off uh, because they couldn't compete. Uh, by the 1920s, they couldn't compete with the Japanese production. So they literally closed off the empire uh, to Japanese exports. That's part of the background for the Pacific War in the 1940s. The United States did the same with its smaller empire, the Philippines. The Dutch did the same with Indonesia. Uh, all the imperial systems decided no more free trade, we can't compete. Uh, so they closed off the empire, meaning Japan had no markets, no resources, and they went to work. Uh, that's a large part of the background. The United is he saying because of that they went to war or it was a contributing factor? Because he seems like he's blending those statements together. The States in 1945 did uh, uh, move towards laissez-faire. In fact, there was an important conference. The United States was basically running the world at that point, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, there was a hemispheric conference called by Washington. February 1945 in Mexico, uh, where the Western Hemisphere was compelled to adopt an economic charter for the Americas, uh, which, which banned any interference with market principles. The goal was, you read the State Department reports, to oppose the new nationalism in Latin America, which is based on the idea that the resource that the people of a country should benefit from the country's resources. That's evil. Can't allow that. It's Western and U.S. investors who have to benefit from their resources. So that was the economic charter of the Americas imposed on the countries of the hemisphere, with one exception here. The United States did not follow those policies. Quite the contrary, as I mentioned, there was a massive. So, what were these policies? So that was in America, the goal was America's Western Hemisphere, 1945, and Mexico conference called, for obvious reasons. Uh, there was a hemispheric conference.
called by Washington, February 1945, in Mexico, uh, where the Western Hemisphere was compelled to adopt an economic charter for the Americas. Is this what he's talking about? This might be a subject. Material covering the revolu resolutions for the guidance of the United States delegation to the Mexico City Conference. The following is an outline of our thinking thus far with respect to the position of the United States delegation on the four main topics into which the agenda of the forthcoming conference in Me Mexico is divided. <clears throat> On further cooperative measures for the prosecu per prosecution of the war to complete victory, the United States delegation should be prepared to offer resolutions pertaining to the following subjects. Control of subversive activities. These resolutions are designed to prevent the occurrence of the Axis subversion activities in this hemisphere after the war. Let me, let me see specifically what he's saying here. Uh, which which banned any interference with market principles. So we can find something with a market. Look up trade or something. Liberal principles of international trade conducted with peaceful motives and based on equality and treatment of fair equitable practices. I mean, that sounds sounds good for everybody. Maybe it's not. I don't know. International, international cooperation for the betterment of the economic and social welfare, 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 welfare of the people, including the adequate remuneration of labor, payment of labor, improvement, the standards of living and protections, preser preservation of health. <clears throat> Is he saying this only applied for America and not for other, other countries? Uh, at Mexico City, the following assurances should be given to the other American republics. Transition of the war procurement program will be orderly, gradual, and will follow the principle of consultation. Support and provide an orderly transition from war procurement to full peace. Time trade will be by means of inter-American loans to be made on a joint basis to be agreed upon between individual country concerned and the United States for the purpose of providing minimum essential production of particular raw materials, which would otherwise unbalance the economies of certain of the other American republics. The goal was, you read the State Department reports, to oppose the new nationalism in Latin America, which- Elimination of excessive economic nationalism. So for globalization, for global trade, where can I read more about this point? Okay, but how do you, how do we find out what exactly was done? Sure, sure. Man, you'd have to read this whole fucking thing, dude. Is this, is this it? It's like, this is the bullet point, but what's, what exactly is, is said or what's the regulation, you know? Because that's a very, very general kind of statement. And you can interpret that as a good or bad thing. Like, for example, what if South America had a resource which other countries wanted or needed? And they just, and they made the argument for nationalism in that we will only sell to and service within our country and you can't have any. That would kind of be a bad thing. That would be excessive. So in that regard, I would agree. But you can make the case that, well, what if they need, what if America prescribed a quota and that quota was in, more in favor of the United States rather than South America and it benefited America more, that could be a bad thing. And a bad thing dependent upon what that quota and how much it proportionally affected, um, disproportionately affected each country. So in, in one, in one regard, it could be exploitative to establish a quota of some kind of market good towards a country that's more in favor of the country outside of that. And that would be a bad thing, but it like, we just need more information on 
this exact sentence, you know, what were the policies, what happened in history, what were the people who wrote this thinking, what made them write this? It's a very, very loaded statement, which could go either way. Like this guy is saying, in short, the U.S. wants to make sure that Latin America continues to fill its service function without excessive economic nationalism that would encroach on U.S. interests. Is it that? Or is it that it wanted to be fair? Is it that it wanted to be a case where you couldn't be, the country couldn't be entirely selfish and not open to a market? Yeah. Uh, that's a whole, uh, maybe I'll make a note of that and read some stuff later to check that out. It's, I mean, that, that's kind of like, that's pretty interesting in, in and of itself. It's based on the idea that the resource that, that the people of a country should benefit from the country's resources. That's evil. Can't allow that. It's Western and U.S. investors who have to benefit from their resources. So that was the economic charter of the Americas imposed on the countries of the hemisphere, with one exception here. The United States did not follow those policies. Quite the contrary. As so then, is there a case where America, let's, let's do the extreme, where America has a resource or something, a service, where they deny other countries that market to purchase that good or service? Is that what happened? Is it, was it a case where, hey, what's up, Newsy, Newsy Bonk? <laughs> Um, or is it a case where um, they set up regulation where it benefited America slightly more or to the point of where it was just so inhibiting to other countries that um, it was excessive nationalism in and of itself in the U.S.? You know, I, I don't I don't know exactly. I don't know. But I think it's for his argument. He should definitely present that rather than uh, rather than just having a bullet point to refer to like that. I mentioned there was a massive development of a state-based economy with an industrial policy, uh, the kind that created the modern high-tech economy. Massive development of quite the that again. The United States did not follow those policies. Quite the contrary, as I mentioned, there was a massive development of a state-based economy with an industrial policy. Uh, the kind that created the modern high-tech economy. Uh, you can see it right across the river. Take, take a look at MIT, right? One of the main centers of this. If you looked at MIT in the 1950s when I got there, it was surrounded by uh, uh, electronics-based high-tech firms like Raytheon and iTech, you know, huge I, uh, IT firms. Uh, you take a look at MIT today, take a look at the buildings. It's Novartis, uh, Pfizer, and so on. The reason is completely obvious. During the 50s and the 60s, the cutting edge of the economy was electronics-based. So the, the way to get the public to pay for it was to scream Russians and to get them to pay higher taxes for the Pentagon. And then the Pentagon would fund uh, the research and development, like my own salary, for example, I shouldn't complain too much, and uh, the uh, uh, and of course a private, a so-called private industry was around there, like vultures, to pick up the uh, the products and the research and to market it. Well, since the 70s, the cutting edge of the economy has been moving towards. <laughs> Hold on, I <laughs> have to adjust this. I was I was trying to set up like a new follower thing and um I didn't have a text to like align it. I'm looking over, I'm like, why does it say noisy bonk right in the center? <laughs> That's fine. I'll uh I'll make it clear later. It's kinda all weird now. Being biology based. So funding, government funding has shifted. Pentagon funding is declining funding from the NIH and other so-called health-related government institutions is increasing. And the private corporations understand that. So now uh, Novartis, uh, you know, Gen, 
genetic engineering firms and so on are hanging around uh, trying to pick up the research that you're paying for uh, so that they can market it and make profits. It's just transparent. It's in front of our eyes. And it takes a very effective... Is that a bad thing, though? Is it a bad thing that companies are taking advantage of um, government, uh, let's say, funding or contracts? The educational system to prevent people from seeing it. It's virtually transparent. That's the way really existing capitalist democracy works. Let's say a final word about democracy, and then I'm afraid I have to leave. Uh, I mean... Maybe if a company creates a scenario where maybe they lobby for some kind of scenario where, um, see, I don't, I don't even know. I'm trying to think like, uh, like, why would that be a bad thing? Wait, let me listen to that again. Is he like, I think he's painting this as a bad thing. The private, so-called private industry was around there like vultures to pick up the, uh, the products and the research and just market it. Well, since the seventies, the cutting edge of the economy has been moving towards being biology based. So funding, government funding has shifted. Pentagon funding is declining. Economy is going towards biology based. So funding from the government is going that way too? Funding from the NIH and other so-called health related government institutions is increasing. And the private corporations understand that. So now, so private corporations see this and want to take advantage of it. I think the Novartis, uh, you know, gen, genetic engineering firms and so on are hanging around, uh, trying to pick up the research that you're paying for, uh, so that they can market it and make profits. It so they can market it and make profits. So in real world sense, that would be like saying. Uh, there's government research. They want to fund a company to uh, improve the health of, let's say, like cardiovascular health of people. So, and therefore, a drug company may see this and say, um, "We want to get involved in this," and they want to create a drug. They want to use that funding, or let's say, contracts to create a drug that uh, maybe stops heart attacks or lessens them, or is like a they create like a blood thinner. Or, I, I don't know, something hopefully health beneficial in a drug company sense? It's just transparent. It's in front of our eyes. And it takes a very effective... Uh... Like, maybe that's a bad thing if it's... Um, see, I don't even know, because... <laughs> I don't know how you could paint that as purely bad. I mean, there could be bad things which come from it. But I don't think it's inherently bad. Like, okay, for example, maybe if that company who created that drug for the heart or, you know, like something with the, like, cardiovascular, let's say it was just a crap drug and um, it produced all these side effects which hurt people. Um, but maybe, maybe not. Maybe it... Maybe it helped a lot of people and had very small side effects. And are e are any of those cases a bad thing? Because even if you go to the extreme bad where, like, say, like, yeah, lots of people got hurt from that drug. Well, wouldn't that also create a market for other companies to produce a drug which is better than that, which doesn't produce side effects? And then from that, wouldn't there come regulations or proposed regulations from government and policies which, you know, Say you need warning labels, you need to create a drug within these kind of standards, you need FDA standards. So like that, later on down the line, I, you would think that even though some bad things could occur from that, that ultimately good would come of that, or hopefully, which uh, hopefully that's kind of what you see today, right? There's still drugs which have lots of side effects, but um, there's still cases where there's people who are in such extreme conditions where they have nothing to rely on but a drug, you know? And I mean, obviously you don't want like dependency or a case like that, but it's like, that's sometimes what happens. And is that, is that terrible? Educational system to prevent people from seeing it. It's virtually transparent. That's the way really existing capitalist democracy works. Let's say a final word about democracy, then I'm afraid I have to leave. Uh, 
there's a major attack on democracy all the way through. That by now it's reached the point uh, which is pretty remarkable. I mean, you take a look at main, one of the main topics in mainstream political science, you know, I'm not talking about radicals, mainstream political science is comparing public attitudes with public policy. It's a fairly straightforward, you know, it's hard work, but straightforward effort. We have the public policy, so you can see it. There's extensive polling, quite reliable, generally consistent in its results. It gives you a good sense of what public attitudes are. Uh, and the results of this are published in the major uh, books and articles, I'll give you references if you like. Uh, the results are very straightforward. Uh, about 70% of the population, the lowest 70% on the income scale, are literally disenfranchised. Uh, their opinions have no effect on policy. Their elected representatives don't pay any attention to them. Uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why many of them don't bother voting. Uh, they're not going to pay attention to them anyway. They may not read the technical literature, but you understand it in other ways. Uh, as you move up the income scale, you begin to get a little more, uh, a little more influence on policy. When you get to the top, and uh, contrary to the Occupy movement, it's not 1%. It's more like one-tenth of 1%. When you get to the top, where the massive concentration of wealth is, they basically set policy. That's, that's not democracy, that's plutocracy. And that's what we have accepted. And the good thing about it is it's changeable. It's not controlled by force. We are very free in that respect, thanks to victories over the centuries. It's not possible. Okay, so he's saying that um, concerns of the the common folk aren't heard and therefore put policies in place which reflect their concerns, which is probably true, um, but maybe not. That's something that you need. You need to back that up with like substantial claims, like because that would uh, having that as an absolute statement would mean well uh, in the first place would any kind of minimum what do you call it um minimum pay i forget what you call it like the seven dollar an hour minimum that would never exist right but that's a product of a common working the street porter as adam smith would put it <laughs> right that would be that would be a case where that has been put into policy, contradictory to that absolute kind of viewpoint of the tenth of one percent creates policy. Um, I'm sure there's like a, I'm sure there's a decent list of other things like that. But um, and you'd also have to to you'd also have to like give references to okay, here's what the common person wanted and needed, and we establish that as moral and righteous. I don't know and necessary. And it hasn't been put into place because of this one tenth of one percent who lobbied against that. That would also be like something that you would need or it would be a great supporting statement or reference to that that idea. Um, but I, I mean, I would I would assume that there's a good deal of that of truth to that, you know, but you can't make an absolute statement of the one percent are just creating all the policy. In other ways. Uh, as you move up the income scale, you begin to get a little more, uh, a little more influence on policy. When you get to the top, and uh, contrary to the Occupy movement, it's not one percent; it's more like one tenth of one percent. When you get to the top, where the massive concentration of wealth is, they basically set policy. That's that's not democracy; that's plutocracy, and that's what we have accepted. The good thing about it is it's changeable. It's not controlled by force. We are very free in that respect, thanks to victories over the centuries. It's not possible now for a corporation to do what Andrew Carnegie, the great pacifist, did in 1890. That gives a lot of options, and you have to make use of them. I'm afraid I gotta leave. 
Okay, let's recap all of this. No, no, I'm not. This is, this is so much to take in. So many, so many loaded things to take in and decipher. I started by saying that one of the relations between capitalism and democracy is contradiction. You can't have capitalist democracy. And the people who really sort of believe in markets, or at least pretend to understand that, so if you read Milton Friedman and other apostles of so-called libertarianism, they don't call for democracy. They call for what they call freedom, which is a very, in, a very uh, capitalism and democracy really are made by unaccountable private concentrations of wealth, uh, interference in markets. It's not true. It's the icon, you know, of liberty. Uh, he's, uh, he was considered to be a dangerous radical again against what is now called neoliberal globalism. That's the one use of the term in wealth of nations. And that's his other use of the term, which talks about can possibly be. And therefore, in any civilized society, the government will have to intervene to prevent any development like this. In fact, India already was the commercial. They're the countries who violated the principles England. Oh, so I don't think he made a good case that you cannot have a capitalist democracy. I think he made a good case that here's things that have gone wrong at times. Here's things that have been exploited at times. Didn't specify events like he, like he did point to like a document or like a meeting, but not like historical occurrences which supported that and the con and like the the ideas behind why that statement was established um I, I just don't think he did a good job of set like it's it's just it's a very strong assertion that you cannot have a capitalist democracy and it just feels like everything you referenced was things that could could or have potentially gone wrong <sighs> like you have to think about Okay, maybe coming from his point of view, maybe he views the common person as not having a voice, not having an influence in policy, capitalism or democracy not benefiting the, the common folk the most, and the people who rule or the people in business, they exploit, they are hypocritical and are there to sustain their greed and desires and endeavors and therefore those th those two things can't coexist that that market that capitalist society along with the desires and wants and needs of the common person and first of all you, like you have to break down each word of what he's saying even as simple as de the word democracy what does democracy mean to him? And what does democracy mean as a definition? And what does it mean in different iterations of the your interpretation of democracy? Because democracy, how I view it today, can be interpreted in so many ways. Quite literally, like it's, it's so hard to even find a classic reference to the definition of democracy. And that's through the context of the word itself, through when it was first conceived, to when America was established, to current time. There's so it's so it's used interchangeably so many times and meant and has so many loaded contexts and and like preconceived definitions that it, it's so important as going into a, any topic revolving around democracy like you need to specifically define what you mean by democracy because it can mean anything from the majority should rule and they should determine policy or it could mean the majority should elect people who represent them and those elect those elected people should then put in place people who oversee and rule and create the policies which are in, uh, in uh, which are funneled and interpreted through the elected 
In other words, democracy can mean it can mean pure democracy, where simply a majority rules. Democracy can mean republic in that the elected determine policy, or it can mean a mixture of those where democracy is the adjective for a republic. And that's kind of, I think that's kind of like a conservative interpretation of it. Like you go to more extremes where democracy could mean, I don't know, maybe it has to benefit the majority. I, I don't know. I'm sure you could conceive of different extreme interpretations of the word. So like when you, when you say statements like you can't have capitalist democracy, you can see just from just from trying to establish the definition of democracy itself, just that definition, not even talking about like a context within a capitalist society or like uh, like involving a market of any kind in that it, it, it there's so many it, it's <laughs> you need to specify and the lack of that specificity in that phrase and then in the arguments themselves just creates a poor argument and interpretations that are not beneficial to his desires for the argument because i think a lot of people i think a lot of people may listen to this and pull from it very pessimistic view of how the world and capitalism or democracy democracy actually functions um which is which i think is fine you establish in that person almost like a an, an almost a reflexive denial of like like a different viewpoint which is just, which is kind of like a, just a problem in general. You know, if you don't specify things, then you, you establish like these ideologies in people's heads of where it almost has to align with that. I don't know. Let's read what some of these people have to say about it. In the comments here, Get rid of this sidebar. Great speech, but his brother's wedding was no place to give me. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh man. His take on Adam Smith deserves to be studied in depth. I mean, he was, it wasn't his take. That's, I think he was referencing exactly what Adam Smith was saying. The word freedom is used deceptively on purpose by corporations. People need to also cite this. See, and then you get people saying this kind of stuff. U.S. is definitely not more like an oligarchy. Maybe it is. I don't know. But you gotta, you gotta support that statement, man. Oh, here we go. Uh, oh, this is what he referenced here. Capitalist democracy is an oxymoron. It's not, though. See, <laughs> you get people wanting to write gotcha quotes like that, and it, I don't think it is, though. It can be, but I don't think it is. <clears throat> so I think all in all, you just see, like, a lot of loaded interpretations here. A lot of loaded interpretations. That's the best way to summarize. And I wish someone would push for clarification you know in the ways that i'm kind of talking about i think that would be great you know to sit him down and to sit noam chomsky down and say oh, well what is democracy how do you define democracy what is capitalism how do you define capitalism and what are these two things together what are they not why this why that what was the division of labor thing on adam smith forget that uh oh he's talking about liberalism and what it what the view really was on adam smith um oh this is this is something to watch too oh is that lawrence krauss okay okay all right well i'm gonna end it here uh i think it's good to like jump into like i i personally have looked at a lot of noam chomsky videos and i can already decipher what he means by democracy what he means by capitalism and I already have an idea of like these like these preconceived ideas and like interpretations that he has formed in his mind. So I think it's I think it's important to also like visit this video when you also have listened to things of like how he interprets democracy and how he interprets democracy today and in history. And therefore you establish like what his definition is or like what you know, because like I, I can't or you can't ask Chomsky what his definition of things are so that you can kind of get it 
through a sense of watching some of his other videos. And then you come back to this and you get like a better understanding of like, oh, this is why he thinks that way. But um, yeah, that's it for today. Um, I mean, I might, uh, I don't know when I'm going to stream. This is my first stream here. I don't know if I'll make this like a daily thing. Maybe I'll do like a video a day, something like this. Maybe like a two hour thing. But uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. I'll be back at some point. All right, guys.